All right, we got Rick Urish and Tom Murphy, founders of Sweethearts and Heroes. We were having some great conversations offline before this as well. Two jokesters, guys that have known each other forever, and they they go back and forth. It's an absolute pleasure to have you guys on. Thanks for coming on. Oh, it's great to be here, Antonio. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and, and so we're, there will be friction. I want to address the audience right now that there will be a little bit of friction to run this podcast, given that we have four people on the same platform. So we're going to do our best, but there might be some ways to interrupt and also... Rick and Tom just love to interrupt each other as I've deduced over the last 10 minutes. So I'm, I'm excited for this, but why don't you guys, one of you guys take the reins and explaining a little bit more about your story together and where you've been. I know you guys have had some entrepreneurial ventures as well, and then kind of where you're at today. All right. I'll jump in quick. Um, you know, Sweethearts and Heroes was a happy little accident as the great Bob Ross would say, uh, I found myself talking to young people, leadership, motivational kind of stuff, uh, after being on a reality TV show, uh, which is a whole nother story, but people just called me and said, Hey Tom, could you talk to my kids? And I've got quite a business background, the railroad industry and, uh, a small business as well. And, uh, found myself doing that. A friend of mine from college that I wrestled with called me up and said, Hey, can you do something on bullying? And I'm like, eh, I guess so. And, uh, I did it. Another school was there. Um, and, uh, somewhere, you know, doing it for a year or two, uh, I ran into Rick at a, at an event. And if I had time to tell you the story, you'd believe in cosmic forces, the way that we actually came together, but we, our paths crossed. Um, I reached out to him for a long time. He completely ignored me, uh, never got back to me. And then that's where that, uh, cosmic forces come in, reconnected us, uh, begged him to come and watch. And you say, well, why would you beg him to come and watch if you were just doing like leadership, motivational, a little bit of bullying. You know, after I got done talking to kids, um, I've just got this wave with kids gravitating towards me. And it has to do with my childhood, which is another story. Um, but most kids were coming up and trying to tell me their story. And most of them were about this feeling of hope and hopelessness. Uh, and make no mistake about it, gentlemen, our young people today might be one of the generations that feel the greatest amount of hopelessness in the history of the human race. And you say, well, how can you say that, Tom? Things like suicides in 10 to 14 year olds have tripled since 2007. So as I was talking to kids and they're bringing me these stories, and I ran into Rick. I'm like, I need this guy. I need him. And Rick didn't really want to get involved because he heard sweethearts and heroes. And Rick Yarish says, I'm not a hero. I've worked with heroes before. Um, I'm not a hero. And uh, he'd take a very humble approach. And he thought like we were trying to use him as our token hero. But it could have nothing could have been further from the truth. I really needed Rick involved because he understands hope and hopelessness like no one's business. I conned him into coming to watch. I'll end I'll land my plane on this. You know, two and a half million kids later from Houston to Hawaii to Montreal and back. Rick and I spent 200 to 220 days a year on the road together, you know, peddling this message of hope and this mes message of action. And uh, we're, we're booked into March already every single day for this coming year. And I don't say that to pat us on the back. I say that because the need could not be greater. That's so incredible. That, that's a little bit of the background. That's incredible. And, and Rick, I'd love your perspective on it as well and your, your platform to share the story, please. Yeah. Um, so I, um, you know, really my story truly begins uh, when I was injured in Iraq. I mean, it obviously begins before that with joining the army and even being in high school and not doing very well, which led me to join the army. But really what it really started was when I was injured uh, in uh, September of 2006 and uh, my vehicle was hit with an IED over in Iraq and uh, I was um, burned very badly and I lost my right leg below my knee. But one of the things I lost uh, the most was who I was and uh, I had to find that again. You know, I was no longer a soldier after my injury and I didn't know who I was. I was kind of very, very lost and got into the public speaking world, which I didn't know I wanted to do. Um, but I think it was something I needed to do. It helped me recover. And then I realized that my message could actually also help people. Um, but when I met Tom in Sweethearts and Heroes, I was just sharing my message of what happened to me. Like, uh, hey, here's a war story. That's really what it was. And when I met Tom, it was like, hey, you got more than that um, to give people. And that's when I recognized that, you know, my story is about hope and uh, hopelessness. And 
the only reason I can even go into a school and talk about hope is because I know the other end of it. I know the hopelessness part, like laying on the ground in Iraq on fire. I gave up. I was absolutely hopeless. Uh, thankfully, I rolled into a canal. I was only hopeless for a second, and it saved my life. Uh, there's been times in the hospital during my, my recovery that I felt hopeless. But I had amazing people around me every time. Uh, to help me get through those things. So that's my message when I go into schools is, you know, H-O-P-E, it stands for hold on possibilities exist. So we got to have inner strength to do that. We got to have patience to be able to do that. But we also need other people in our lives to give us hope when we're really, really struggling. And uh, I'm to the point now where when I do struggle, I will ask for help. I've got no problem with that. Um, and that's sometimes really difficult for people is to say, hey, I need your help because that's admitting you can't do it on your own. But who cares? That's silly to really even care about that. Um, yeah. if you can't do it on your own. You got to have help from other people. So here I am. I'm it's 17 years later. Um, you know, in six days, it'll be uh, 17 years. And, you know, I'm telling you right now that I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life. And that's, you know, 24 years of looking normal and then the last 17 of not. I'm happier than I've ever been before. And um, I'll tell you also today that I look at that day 17 years ago as the best thing that ever happened to me because I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing. I wouldn't be able to tell people about hope if uh, this didn't happen to me. So that's where I am. And I'm, uh, like I said, extremely happy married. Uh, I have two children. Uh, life is good, even though it's been crazy. That's, that's incredible. I appreciate the perspective there. And, and so... Let's as someone who I, I've I'm the co-founder of a kids program as well. And so I'm super passionate about this mission. So I want to learn a little bit more about what you guys are up to with Sweethearts and Hero. Like what I know you guys said that you're booked out. You guys are working with kids. It sounds like you guys speak a lot at like assemblies. But what is the fulfillment and the actual model of what Sweethearts and Heroes does? So let, let me just, can I just back up for one second? Because Rick said something powerful that your listeners need to hear, because I, I don't know many human beings that have not been blown up. And you say, what do you mean, Tom? Um, well, we've all been blown up. You know, I, I read a little bit about you two. You had the classic story of, you know, somebody walked by and kicked your plug out of the wall. Um, youth sports or college sports. And you're like, now what? That became your complete significance, right? That's the, one of the great dangers of youth sports. And I'm a, I'm a product of youth sports. I wrestled my whole life all the way through college. One day somebody kicks your plug out of the wall and it's over. And you're like, what do I do? That was my significance. And when Rick Yaris said to me years ago, I remember where I was sitting, I was actually standing at a table with him, staring into his nostril holes, which sounds kind of weird. That's just what I remember. It and he doesn't said, this sound is weird. It is weird. <laughs> but, but he says to me, he goes, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And, you know, for wow. a year, I was like, you have to say that. Like, you have no choice. But as I started to see young people gravitate to him, understanding that there are possibilities that exist, no matter what you're going through. And let me tell you, man, kids have been through some stuff. And not just the pandemic. But when we just talk about kids not being resilient the way humans have been for thousands and thousands of years, losing certain human skills, empathy has been cut in half in the last 30 years. And when you when you see a guy say that to you, you think, eh, you know, I've read Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And 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 what he says in there that he says um, the greatest source of meaning is the attitude that we take towards the unavoidable suffering that we go through. He said, the greatest form of meaning is the attitude that we take towards the unavoidable suffering that we go through. You read that and you're like, yeah, man, that's so powerful. But you've never really been through anything like that. You've never been blown to heck. And when you meet someone like Rick and he says that and you really start to pay attention. And when you watch him and you watch young people gravitate to him and he can say, listen, if I could change this tomorrow and snap my fingers and get it all back, I wouldn't do it. I mean, he blew my mind when he told me that. Uh, but what he was saying was, I'd have to take back all that hope I've given to other people, and it wouldn't be worth it. And that's exactly what Franco was talking about. And, and, and really, that's the magic of Rick Yarish. I mean, he's completely changed my life and my perspective. I mean, my eyeball gets jacked up, and I'm like, dude, this is going to be freaking awesome, right? I owned a restaurant for 12 years, right? Had the best 2019 in the history of the restaurant. After losing $200,000 my first two years. And we get blown up, never do any takeout and delivery at all. 
you know what I said sitting on my couch when the when the state of Vermont called and said shut it down for three months? You know what I went into the restaurant and told the employees? I said this is going to be the best thing that's ever happened to us. We had the two greatest years in the history of the restaurant during 2020 and 21, not by a little bit. We had a 47 and a half percent increase in our gross revenue and we were closed for three months. Any restaurateur would call me a liar. I'll show you the numbers. But it came from one thing from that man on this call, because he told me no matter what you're going through, it could be the best thing that's ever happened to you. So I know I just went on a little ramble, but he tripped that. Every human on earth should know that. I'm sure, Landon, you want to jump in. I see you, man. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Tom, like how has your you know, entrepreneurial background and your athletic background helped you in this venture? Like how has that bridged over into this world uh, as, a, as a whole? I think it's bridged well for both of us. You know, I, I, I don't have an off switch, man. I'm on seven days a week, 365 days a year. But Rick and I, and this is Rick Yarish's outside of his message and his hope. Um, the one thing I can say about Rick Yarish, man, he shows up. And I think that all of us on this call understand consistency and showing up. And I don't know who it was. The famous actor said 85% of success is just showing up. And, uh, you know, I think that that's that's where I would start that conversation, man. I mean, I can go wide and deep on this one about how sports and wrestling was my savior. And you took this kid who had ADHD and who was a disaster for teachers and focused him. Uh, but I think the biggest thing, man, is we show up, Rick and I, we get in front of kids, we get in front of teachers and we use that wonderful gift that youth sports and sports gave us. And if you're going to win, you got to show up. And how did you guys start getting your, your, your foot in the door at these, at these schools? Right. So like, it's, it, you know, how are you able to grab attention? How are you, how are you initially able to kind of compound that? Right. I, you have your first couple relationships or maybe one key relationship that obviously compounds into now you're able to travel and, 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 and touch a lot of lives, but how did that all start out? Rick, you want to jump in and, and yeah. I'll... quickly touch on that. Cause you know, Tom knows more about that than I do, but I know in the beginning it was certainly not easy, you know, sending out emails and uh, phone calling the schools. And um, I can remember one month uh, I sent out 330 emails and I, Wow. personally addressed them to every single person with their name on it. And uh, I received three responses out of the 300 and some emails that I sent and I booked one of the three and I did it for free. So that's where, that's how it starts in the beginning though. And um, I don't think it's all for not, at least you're trying to get out there, but eventually once we started to get in a few schools, it all ended up being by uh, word of mouth. That's the only way we would get into schools. A, a principal would say, hey, we had these guys and, you know, uh, you should try them out. And that's how we got in. And, and it's crazy. Last year, I think is the first year, you know, 11 years in, 12 years in that we actually had to turn schools away. Wow. Um, but it started in the beginning as like, I don't even know if we can get five schools this year. And now it's to the point where so it's, you know, the word consistency. I mean, you got to keep at it. Keep going. Yeah. I, I, I will I will jump in and just tell you real quick, because I have this discussion with a lot of people. They want to be speakers and everybody wants to be a speaker, an entrepreneur. I mean, it's just the way of the world today. Um, public schools and private schools uh, are different um, in the speaking world, because as Rick said, you could send out a thousand videos and promotional things. And that that principal superintendent gets hit with a thousand of them. Um, and, and I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation with young speakers um, in that world. It's 100 percent or ninety nine point nine nine percent word of mouth, because you got to remember there you got some older people from a different generation, Generation X and above. And if you haven't read Robert Greene's book, uh, Laws of Human Nature, both of you, it should be top on your list, along with uh, his 48 Laws of Power. Those books will ruin you, too. Uh, but he has this wonderful thing on generational narcissism. And uh, it's just it's mind blowing. Have you guys heard him talk at all or I've heard 48 laws of power. Right, right. But his laws of human nature, he talks about generational narcissism. And that's really what you're battling. You're battling a gen, a, a, a baby boomer, a Gen Xer 
um, that thinks they know it all, but they also are scared to death to lose their job. And if you bring in a dud of a speaker, um, your teachers, the school board, the students, like no one's doing it. But when someone sees us and they're like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this in 20, 30, 40 years of education. I mean, we went out to Kentucky, Kentucky, did one presentation. They were so mesmerized. And I feel like I'm like doing this back padding thing. Uh, but you bring Rick Yarish and everybody's mesmerized. But we went to Kentucky this summer and did 2000 administrators for one reason, because one administrator saw us and said, oh, my gosh. So that's a that's a big, long conversation. If anybody on your podcast ever wants to listen and, or, or get a hold of me and say, man, how do I get to public schools? I'll give them some nuggets because it's a different animal. It definitely is. And it's not this world where you can just like run ads and, and make an immediate sale, especially if you if you're charging for stuff like the layers that you have to go through in the public school system to get something passed inside of the budget, even if it's for a thousand dollars is incredible. That's that's a learning experience that I had to go through as well. So so tell us a little bit more about what the vision looks like, though, like from a from a like a mission standpoint, but then also from a business model standpoint. Yeah. Rick, you want to jump in first and say anything? Well, I mean, we want to reach every single kid in uh, the United States. I mean, that would be the goal. But here's the problem, <laughs> you know, and it's that further vision. Um, that's impossible to do face to face. We can we will never be able to do that. So now it's time to grow. And uh, how do you do that? We don't exactly know the exact solution to that. Um, but we're trying things out. Uh, we have a hope series that people can uh, go on. Schools can buy subscriptions to. Um, so that's probably the answer for us now. But how do we push that? So it's just a whole new thing. You know, we learned how to push ourselves into schools. We have no problem with that anymore. But now we have to learn something totally different. And uh, we don't expect it to happen right away. Like we know that this stuff takes time. So uh, that's kind of the vision. You know, how do we get to every single kid in the United States of America? How is that going to happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a great answer, Rick. And, you know, we, we're launching this hope. It's called the Hope Classroom. Uh, right now you can go to hopeseries.com. But um, for pre-orders, we're launching it. We have a, just a tremendous amount of content. We have a great film crew that does some stuff for us, um, great editors. Uh, but to, to kind of answer your question, because people see the tip of this Sweethearts and Heroes iceberg, and they see this dynamic set of presentations, K-12, to and they're like, oh, my gosh, we couldn't get any better. Uh, we have a full-blown set of classes that we run in schools, and uh, they're self-directed, self-controlled student leadership classes. And really, a lot of our deeper work is around the science of empathy, how it germinates, how it grows, how we restore it in our youth today, um, why it's gone the wrong direction. Also, many of these other human skills, and I'm sure both of you have had lots of conversations um, and most of them were just destroyed in young people because we killed this thing called self-directed, self-controlled play, P-L-A-Y. And I'm a huge, I, I could spend the next three hours talking about play science with you. Um, every mammal has a play cycle. And a lot of the work that we do really leverages not generational uh, particularities, but it spans mammalian play cycles. And when you really understand, I mean, do either one of you know what your play personality is or your multiple play personalities? You have one. Um, the great Stuart Brown wrote a great book called Play, P-L-A-Y. And you should know it. Um, this is a great another nugget for your, for your listeners. Um, you should understand your play history and your play personality. Because Stuart Brown says whenever you tie your play history and your play personality to your adult life, you always find joy. And not happiness, you find joy. And I can go to a room with 100 teachers and say, who played teacher growing up? And maybe 75% of them will put their hands in the air. Uh, the other 25% during the day, I'll find some of them and they'll be like looking at their watch like, I got six years, 13 days, six hours, you know, uh, 12 minutes and six seconds left. And I'm like, oh, you never played teacher growing up, did you? And uh, <laughs> they're like, no. So I I'm off on into a little rabbit hole here, and I'll pull myself no, back it's, out. It's, it's cool, though. It's cool. I I'll pull myself out. But the depth of what we do, it's as, it's as, and I already used this once, but it's as long as it is wide. 
from adversity stuff that Rick does and and uh, to the classes that we have, whether they're six week programs or full year classes that we run in school. We also do this thing called circle and circle is the most important place in my whole life. If I had time to tell you how I drug circle into this restaurant of mine and which really became the catalyst for building a culture of belonging. And I mean, Harvard has done a ton of work and studies and there's a wonderful study that just shows uh, what happens when you create cultures of belonging and uh, communities, what it does in terms of employee retention and what it does in terms of revenue growth. And, and most people just don't have the time for it because life is so fast and we got to push, 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 push. And we're entrepreneurs. Uh, but really, you got to go backwards, whether it's the seeds that get planted in play or, or whether it's just the human skills that we develop in play, our cooperation, our teamwork, our, all of those things. Little kids have thousands of hours of practice. And so our deeper work really leverages a lot of that play science, a lot of student empowerment. We empower students. We don't lecture them. And I think that's why so many kids find the work that we do so darn addictive. So I know I was all over the place there. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. No, seriously. Awesome. How can, you know, for our listeners that have organizations that they're in charge of, that they're running, how can they implement some of these tools and strategies with their own team to enhance their culture, to enhance the relationships they have with the people that they're building with? Well, dude, you got to learn about circle, man. Uh, I'll be, I did Rick and I were out in California uh, a couple months ago, we did circles with infantry Marines. Now, I don't think you know what that means if you're not in. Half of these young men, and I, I apologize for saying this for any Marines listening, half of those men should be in jail. <laughs> these are the guys that are on the fringe of everything, right? Here, take this gun and run through that door. Like, I'm not doing that because I'm not an infantry Marine. But they have a different coding. And we did circle with these Marines. One of the circles... I'll think about on my deathbed, it was so powerful. We do them with businesses. We do them with real estate companies. We do them with uh, all kinds of people. If you're human, you belong in circle. It's a practice that's been around for over 400,000 years. And that's really some of the deepest stuff that we do is around circle. Um, anybody wants to know more about circle. I give our circle stuff away for free. I've done nine multi-day seminars this summer. I got two next week back to back. Um, so, uh, I, I would say that, uh, I, I give our stuff away, man, when people, especially young entrepreneurs, uh, get a hold of us and say, you know, here's how we do it. Yeah. And I like, I like a little mystery around it. Right. But just without, without diving, diving into it too heavy, like what is the general gist of kind of that experience? Uh, like, what do you get into? Is it, is it, it sounds like it gets pretty deep. It can, man. Um, yeah. you, you know, it's, uh, if you look at, I, I want to tell you everything right now. There's, I, I don't hold mystery that so people get by, get to us and buy something. Um, there's just a lot to it. When you look at empathy, and empathy is the most important thing. The only reason we are here as human beings on planet Earth at this stage is because of empathy, because we've learned to share resources and we've learned to help people that are struggling so that when we're struggling, people can help us. That's the magic. And that's been the message of Sweethearts and Heroes for years. And Circle just accelerates that at an, at an unbelievable exponential rate. And... Um, in terms of germinating empathy and building empathy. And that's just one component of circle. The other one, when you look at the, the, the core competencies of social and emotional health, and that, those are all kinds of bells that are ringing now when you say those words today. Um, I'm a traditionalist when it comes to social emotional. I believe in the work that James Comer did in the 1960s, just around these five core competencies of self-awareness knowing your feelings and why you're feeling a certain way. People think that's all kind of fruity, like rainbows and unicorns. No, you got to be aware of your mental state and your, your, your conscious and your subconscious state. If you want to move forward, you can't manage feelings unless you know what they are moving into ma self-management, moving into responsible decision-making. You want to talk about business and responsible decision-making moving into social awareness, and then you both know there's nothing to life 
than relationships. The relationship that Rick and I have, the relationship that you two have, you can move mountains when you have relationships. So all of that stuff comes together in circle and it builds an unbelievable environment of trust. And I'll, I'll end on this. I just read this the other day. Dude, this blew my mind. It was uh, um, uh, McD- um, George McDonald. Um, he, he, the guy wrote at the turn of the century. I'm reading one of his books right now, The, the Princess and the Goblin. Um, but uh, he says, this, this is just one of the best quotes I've ever heard in my life. He says that, um, I'm going to screw it up too. He said that um, uh, uh, being uh, uh, ah, Christmas, hold on. Rick, say something so I can just give it to him. I don't want <laughs> to misrepresent here. I, I know the gist of it, but I just don't want to rep- misrepresent uh, I'm just McDonald's surprised quote. you didn't ask me what the quote is. That's what you usually do. Like, Rick, what was I going to say? Dude, what dude, was I... what was I going to say? <laughs> Hold so on. While, is... while, we're, while we're waiting for that, Rick, I, I love your perspective on how, your guy, how you guys have been able to handle this partnership. Because as Landon and I know, business partnerships aren't the easiest, right? But when you find a way to play into each other's strengths, it's massive acceleration at the same time. So I'd love to hear your perspective on how you guys – have made this work over the last, I think it was 10 years that I heard yeah. and what your guys' responsibilities and roles are inside of what you're doing. I think in the beginning it was hard. Um, you know, as you can tell, Tom is certainly type A and uh, on top of everything, push, 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 go, go, go. You know, he said he doesn't have an off switch. And one thing I have that's very useful in my life is an off switch. Um, I am pretty good at turning things off when I need to. Um, but in the beginning, it was tough uh, trying to manage all of that. And now it's just I know what to expect and we we know uh, what to expect from each other. And, you know, I've always just considered myself a really good soldier in life. And, you know, that's back to when I was a soldier. You tell me what to do. I'm going to do it to the very, very best of my ability. And uh, Tom is very good at um, making sure I know what uh, is expected. And uh, so that's just where we're at now. And that's why it's been able to work. He knows what to expect of me. I know what to expect of him. And that's just time and communication and uh, connection, which are extremely important words in in business and in the world, connection, communication. So, so, so so I'll tell you the truth now. Um, (laughs) I stopped being a jerk is what the truth is. And uh, Rick, two years, last year in a hotel room that, he looked at me and he goes, you know, you've changed. And I'm like, I have not. I haven't changed at all. And he goes, dude, you, you, you've you changed. And I know where it came from. It came from all the circle. I did over 600 circles last year myself. And, you know, I started listening better. Um, I It may sound like I'm not a good listener, but that's my superpower today because I've spent thousands and thousands of hours listening to all kinds of people. Um so, but, but Rick hit the nail on the head, man. We've just built this relationship where each of us know our job. Uh, we push each other constantly. And uh, just so both of you know, this word bully in the 16th century actually meant sweetheart. It was a very endearing term. It was someone that kicked you in the shorts and pushed you to become better, faster, stronger, smarter. And uh, it's one of the common threads that we share as humans, that not one of us would be on this call right now if it wasn't for the people that was like, hey, you know, Landon, get your crap and get in the car. You pick this stupid sport. You're finishing the season, you know, or when you were struggling through something, um, you know, and, and, and this is the gift that Rick brought into my life. These these 16th century bullies, you know, Rick could tell you stories right now that would make you cry because when he was thinking about maybe hurting himself or just giving up. You know, the, the universe sent people into his life to give him hope when he needed it the most, to pull him through. But um, I, I do want to back up real quickly. Just I, I want to tell you that quote because I want to rep, not misrepresent what he said. Um, it's just absolutely brilliant. Um, but I also want to say, you know, um, you just mentioned something that we played each other's strengths. And and I do I take a lot of research from Peter Weinman from the <laughs> University of Rochester. And, you know, a buddy of mine actually worked directly with him to build Wingman Connect for the U.S. Air Force. And they, they have an unusually high amount of um, destructive decisions that are made by young techs in the Air Force. And, and you know, the only thing that they've found, and it's been our message from day one, it's been about building networks of strength among peers. And we don't give enough value to that in life, especially with young people. We think it's about what teachers teach, what parents teach. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
And this research from 2021, 2022, just really illustrates just how important peer networks of strength are and young people understanding the strengths of their peers and being able to lean on those strengths when they're struggling. It is absolutely critical. And that's been our message from day one has been about empowering young people to help other young people. But it really comes down to this level of trust that you built. And that's where this George McDonald quote comes in. He said, to be trusted, you both, all three of you think deeply about this because this should rock you. He said, to be trusted is a greater compliment than to be loved. I leave some silence there for a second because, you know, we're all taught that love is the supreme ethic, right? Like that's just what we're taught to believe. But think about it, man. I got family members that I love to pieces, but I don't trust them. Mm. And I think that, you know, that really epitomizes for me. And well, I feel a lump in my throat right now because, you know, I don't like admitting this because Rick will use it against me, but I, I, I trust Rick. And I think I trust him as much as I love him. And I just know he's got my back. I know, uh, I hope he knows I got his back. And But let me tell you, it wasn't easy. I got some video footage of me doing crappy things to Rick and him getting pissed off. And little Tommy Murphy, you know, likes poking the log to see the flames come back up. And uh, I'm sorry, Rick, about the Yeah, book really? Of that's a good, that's a good <laughs> <in> that situation. <laughs> but anyway, anyway. Um, I, I think you guys did a great job summarizing business partnerships in general. Like it, it hits home for me and Landon pretty hard because I, I can definitely sympathize um, with that given that I, I felt like, if I think it's safe to say, Landon, I was the, the Tom in the relationship for quite some time. And I had to do a lot of inner work to realize like, hey, Yes, everything that I'm trying to do is for the sole purpose of making this mission and accomplishing this mission. But that doesn't mean I have to tear down my relationships while doing it at the same time, because at the end of the day, it is a journey and we're having fun doing it. There is no like I think sometimes we get caught in this thing that business is year to year, but really it's spanning our entire lifespan. And we sometimes get caught up in the the social aspect of it that our brains are constructed and wired to to believe in. And it's all false. It's all bullshit. Excuse my language. It's and like so something. Sorry, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go no, ahead, no, no, please. No, I, I, I was going to say another point. <laughs> well, I was going to say it's we were talking about it yesterday. It's like there's two ways to go about problems that show up in your business. There's, you know, there's, you know, me versus Tom or me and Tom versus the problem. You know what I mean? And it's not a that's not a, you know, in, you know, original IP or anything like that. But it's just the way that you can look at problems that arise in your business. There's two ways to go about it. And if if you have that finger pointing mentality and it's and it's me against you or you against me that's where you're going to have all that extra clash. It's not, that's really irrelevant to the vision versus if it's you two against the problem, that's how you, I mean, even if it's with your like romantic partner, it could be the same way, you know, how you can really, you know, limit uh, tension, you know, limit and, and unnecessary I think, friction. I think that's why I'm so inspired by your guys' mission is because if I learned that in elementary school, my life would be so much better to be able to use those tools, which is why I love what, Anyone that's that's doing things that are going to advance the children and their mindsets moving forward and their health, that's the true change that we need to see in the world. People are like, oh, we need to do this and we need to create these policies. Yes, I get it. They're a little bit more short term fixes, but a gener- we're, we're going through a generational problem right now. And it's a 20 year fix that you guys are actively participating in. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I, did, I don't know if you heard that little bit by Elon Musk, and uh, it, it was absolutely brilliant. He's, he said, uh, um, you know, people don't change. And he was somebody was asking about extending life. If you haven't heard this little clip, he, it's brilliant. He's like, he's, they're like, Elon, why don't you, you know, use your brains and your money to help extend life? Because we can extend life to 150 years of age. And he said, did you have you guys heard this? No. He, he's like, that's a bad idea. And you're like, what do you mean? I want to live to 150. (laughs) He's like, people don't change their minds. He said, you get politicians that get stuck in there. And he said, the your your president should be the only a plus or minus a couple years over the median age of the median population. So your your president should be about 35 or so. And he said, people don't change; they just need to die. And (sighs) And, and, and it was really brilliant. You know, it's kind of shocking, but you're like, he's right. You know, the, the jet that the top end of the Gen X's and the and this is a lot of Robert Greene's work and and uh, and the baby boomers, 
they're not changing their perspective on anything. Mm -hmm. You guys are just waiting for them to get out of your way. But then you know what's going to happen because of this that you've done with them? You're going to be them, and then you're going to need to die. But I found that the greatest educators that I've ever met, and I could tell you about 10 of them right now, they take their shield, their generational awareness, or I call it generational awareness, or their narcissistic shield, and they're able to lay it down. And just what Landon said, when when human beings get together, cross-generational, within a generation, and they play with ideas together, the emotional intelligence of the group goes up together. And that's what you want in business, especially today when information is free. The ones that win are the ones that tear down the walls, say we're not going to let our generational narcissism get in the way. And I think that's what Rick and I have done well. Um, and we had to go through a journey, though, and through some fire. Right. Well, there's, there's quick, no – oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rick. Real quick, just you know, with the conversation of the relationships and stuff, like I think you know, with hearing all of this, I, I think of you know, Tom just knows – what I am and what I am not. And I know that from Tom as well. Like I know what he is and what he is not. And we push each other's boundaries and that's okay. But we also have to like, okay, that push too far and that's outside the boundary. And that's just not what I am. And that's not just what he is. So um, we recognize who we are uh, within the group and it's just easier to uh, have a successful business that way. And that's why I think it works is because you're not the same person, right? And, and that's where I had to really learn. I'm still actively learning that where I'm constantly trying to push the way I think on Landon and, and sometimes vice versa. Most of the time, it's just me doing that. Well, but like, definitely I'm th- me too. Yeah, so, so like, because a lot of times, like we're, we're in a world of high performance, right? So we expect everyone else to be that same standard. Now, I do expect Landon to be held at a high standard and, and I expect him to hold me at a high standard. No, no doubt about it. But I can't expect him to have the exact thing that's going on in my mind. And if we were the exact same person, it wouldn't work because then we would just constantly clash. And so we just have to really embrace that little bit of friction and love it and, and, and really appreciate the resistance right there. So thank you guys for, for bringing some uh, clarity on that and, and some experience. So we, we just got some free mentorship right there. <laughs> um, as we wrap up near the end point, we like to do something that as I'm sure if you guys listened before, there it always comes at the end. I know it's a little cheesy, but this is the Consistency Wins podcast. And so consistency is everything for us. That is like our entire mantra. It's exactly why we're here today. What does consistency mean to you guys? And how does that show up in your life? And how does that impact children as well? Well, I know for me and in my, my role in Sweethearts and Heroes, it's about showing up when I'm supposed to show up. And it's about affecting the lives and not just going in and showing up and not caring, but caring as well. So showing up and caring every single time I choose to show up for something, being consistent in that way. Um, Don't just go, go and do your best. Like if I'm there, why not do my best? Um, So I don't know. That's just a part of me. I love doing my job. I love being given a job and doing that job to the very, very best of my ability. You know, I could take this in 10 different directions um, and I just changed based on a little bit of something Rick just said, and it's not going to be like a, you know, a, a showstopper. Um, but, you know, it's easy sometimes for me to be consistent because I'm just so used to it. I don't feel like going to the gym. I go anyway. Like, I don't feel like working out. I go anyway. Like I'm going to break him up. He is the most consistent person I've ever met. No, but he truly is. But, but I would say that, um, it's easy to be consistent and to show up. It's not easy for me. It's easy. Um, it's another thing to show up and to be present with every kid you talk to and, and every teacher you talk to. That's a really hard thing to do. It's an exhausting thing to do, but I can look at any human being in the face. And when I'm with you, I'm with you. And um, I, I, I don't mean mince words about that. You know, um, so my consistency as I continue to get older is about really remaining deeply present with the person. And you really got to be with me to feel that. And it's not something I'm um, it's something I'm working hard on every single day because it's so easy in our world. And I'm including you, too. You got 10 things on your list to do. I've been on the school with four on the phone with four principals this morning already and booked four things for the second half of this year. 
Um, every single one of those people, I'm not like, yeah, let's just check the box. Come on, come on, come on. And it's so easy to do that because I got 10 things to do and the, every one is more important than the one before. I don't do that anymore, man, because I learned and I'll kind of end this on. Hopefully I got just one minute left. Um, I learned this sitting at the base of an auditorium and it's happened to me a thousand times. But I remember the first time it happened to me when I'm done speaking, kids are always sneak back in, find Rick, find me, depending on where they are in their story. But the first time it happened to me, this kid, young man sneaks back in, the lights are down. Um, he's got, I could see he's on the verge of getting emotional, which at that point used to make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, doesn't anymore. And he starts telling me a story about his life and I, I went and, and he started to get emotional. And so I wanted him to stop because I was uncomfortable. And I, I look at the stage that I just came off of. And I said, I said, bro, you're going to be on the big stage someday. And he looked at the stage and he goes, I'm never doing that. I needed to say that for him to get his emotions under control. Cause I didn't know what to do back then. And he goes, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I said, no, dude, the big stage. I said, in your coffin, hopefully years from now, I said, you're not getting out of this one alive. I said, and that made him laugh a little bit. And, and, but what he was talking to me about was the relationships in his life. And I said to him, I said, bro, I said, no one's walking by my casket saying, oh man, what, what a, what a house Tom had, man. Did you see that guy's car? I told this young man, I said, those people don't even show up. I said, the only people that are showing up on your big day are the people whose life you've affected in a positive way. That's it. And people can read through everything. You think they can't? You think they got them, you got them fooled? Guess again. <clears throat> people can read through it. And life comes down to one single word. Relationships. Your relationship with each other, your relationship with us, your relationship with other podcast people, your relationship in business, your relationship in life. And I've had it, man, 17 years. I was making 250000 bucks a year working in the railroad industry as an executive. I gave it all up. You think one person after 17 years really connects with me from that world? Not a one. You know how many people connect with me over the work that we do that touch the heart? Every one of them. So that's the secret to life, man. And uh, I don't need anything anymore. I don't need money. I don't need anything. All I need are the relationships in my life because that's what I work towards every day. And so when I talk consistency, if you ask me, and Rick triggered this in something, he said, um, you know, I just put all in on the individual relationships. You know, I'll, I'll turn a 10-minute interview at a, with a hostess into an hour and a half because I want to know about her story. Because that's mm -hmm. how I can serve her. Every person that you meet is an opportunity to to affect a life and change a life. And when you're operating in a space of good and something you're super passionate about, insecurity just falls to the wayside because you're so secure in that mission. So, I mean, th this hit me deep, and I, that, like I felt a moment of presence that, it, like, I mean, we do five podcasts every Friday for the last four years, and this one, this one really hit. Um, and I really appreciate you guys showing up and giving us your all. And it's not an easy dynamic to, to have four people and we made it work and I thought we did a great job. Um, gentlemen, it has been an absolute pleasure and, and thank you for everything that you guys are doing. How can our listeners connect with you? What is the best way for them to follow you and what's the best way for us to support? Sweetheartsandheroes.com. Uh, you can find almost anything on us um, there. And, you know, we have a YouTube channel. We have Instagram. We, we try to stay up with all the social media stuff. But really, all the information can be found there. And then um, the Hope Series, um, the Hope Series that we're running, the hopeseries.com as well. Awesome. And, and, and if you guys need anything, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I work 24-7, 365. Um, seven days a week. So if there's anything that you need, uh, I promise I'll get back to you. And if any of your listeners, especially if you got a young person in your life that's struggling or an older person, I mean, our, our work is not just dedicated to young people. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out. I get back to everybody a hundred percent of the time. Uh, just sometimes it takes me a bit of time. So Appreciate thanks guys you. for what you're doing. Thank you guys. Thank you, 